Okay, so good afternoon, uh, good morning, everyone. And today, uh, we will be talking one of the we will be like discussing one of the topics here for the finals. And this time, um, the live lecture that is assigned to your section is called non-fermenting and miscellaneous gram-negative bacilli. So before probably before we discuss what do you mean by non-fermenters, let us discuss first what do you mean by fermentation. Okay, so when we say fermentation, we are referring to anaerobic respiration. Meaning to say, it is devoid of oxygen. And during particular anaerobic respiration, complex carbohydrates are actually broken down into a simpler form. For example, polysaccharides are being broken down to monosaccharides. Okay, so that's the reason why um, some bacteria can be identified based on their ability to ferment, to ferment um, glucose, lactose, maltose, things like that. However, for this particular group of bacteria, we will be actually dwelling with non-fermenting, meaning to say, this particular group of bacteria are called asacarolytic. They are called asacarolytic. Asacarolytic uh, primarily because they cannot ferment any carbohydrates at all. So the most popular group among these non-fermenting miscellaneous gram-negative bacilli is the one that I've used here, which is the Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So you would notice that um, in Maconki agar, um, they are white. They have white colonies because, you know, in Maconki agar, you can actually differentiate whether the organisms are lactose fermenters or non-lactose fermenters. Usually, if the organisms are lactose fermenters, um, you will be able to see pink colonies but if the organisms are non-lactose fermenters, you'll see white colonies. So things like that, no? However, um, and then most of them are also oxidase positive. So oxidase positive is characterized by black color uh, in filter paper after you have added the oxidase reagent. Okay, so these are, these are the different um, characteristics of non-fermenting. So common denominator is that they cannot ferment any sugar at all. Okay, so again, we have already defined what we mean by fermentative or fermenters. So meaning to say, um, these are organisms. These are organisms that can ferment carbohydrates. So non-fermenters are organisms that cannot ferment carbohydrates. So what are the general characteristics of non-fermenters? Okay, so most of them are found in environment, particularly where soil and water are present. So they are present on plants, on decaying vegetation, and even in many foodstuffs. So meaning to say, these particular non-fermenters would prefer moist environment, okay? So they prefer and grow much better in an aerobic environment. Okay, so they prefer in aerobic environment. So non-fermenting, so that's the I did mention that a while ago. They are long, thin, gram-negative bacilli. And the reason why they become clinically significant is because of the fact that they tend to be resistant to multiple classes of antibiotics. So since they tend to be resistant to multiple classes of antibiotics and that is the reason why nowadays um, we, we do not want patients to get uh, to get infected with this particular group of bacteria particularly as a secondary bacterial infection for COVID-19. So most of them are oxidase positive which I've already shown you the picture and some group members oxidize car carbohydrates to derive energy for their metabolisms. So instead of calling them fermenters, we would rather call them oxidizers. Again, the difference is that during the process of fermentation, it is an anaerobic respiration, meaning to say um, it is 
actually the failure failure to um, break down carbohydrates in the absence of oxygen. But since they are oxidizers, but since they are oxidizers, therefore that could be press that could be possible. Breaking down of carbohydrates could be possible in the presence of oxygens, but not in the absence of oxygens. So some group members do not break down carbohydrates at all. So that's the reason why they are called non-oxidizers or saccharolytic. Now I'd like to show you this tube. This is the PSI tube or the triple sugar iron. Okay, if you remember the triple sugar iron, the reason why we call it triple is because it, it is has three sugars, sucrose, lactose, and glucose. So the pH indicator in triple sugar iron is phenol red. So if there is fermentation, if there is fermentation, um, the TSI becomes acidic. And if it's acidic, phenol red is turns to yellow. Okay, it becomes yellow. And if it becomes yellow, meaning to say, it is positive for fermentation. It becomes pink. If it becomes pink, meaning to say it is alkaline, so the organisms are not able to ferment. Okay? So this is the original color of the TSI tube. So somewhat orange in color. Okay. So how do we read TSI tube? So the TSI tube is divided into two parts. So we, we, we give an imaginary line here. We create an imaginary line here. So the one that you can see here is the slant. The one that you can see here is a bat. Okay? So we interpret first the slant, and then we interpret the bat. So if the slant is yellow, we read it as A. Or any, if the slant or bat is yellow, we we read it as A. If it's red, it is red as K. If there's blackening, meaning to say there is hydrogen sulfide production. So anyway, um, TSI2 would also have um, ferrous ammonium sulfate. So ferrous ammonium sulfate okay so that is your tsi uh hydrogen sulfide indicator if there's a crack or space such as the one that you can see here there's a gas formation so this tube is the one that you can see here is k over a because um the slant is red and then the bat is yellow so K over A. So if it's K over A, meaning you say only glucose was fermented. This tube over here is K over A with H2S. The reason why we say with H2S because of the blackening. And then this tube over here is A over A with gas. So why with gas? Because um, here, you'll be able to see crack or space. So if there's a crack or space, it means that it has gas. And this one is K over K because it's red over red. So remember, pseudomonas is always K over K. So they fail to acidify they fail to acidify um, triple sugar iron agar. And then we also have the OF media. So in OF media, um, there are actually two setup. Okay. The first setup uh, will test if the organisms are oxidizers. And the second setup will test if the organisms are fermenters. So in fermenters, we add mineral oil on top. The reason why we add mineral oil so that the organisms here 
will not be exposed to oxygen. So for for pseudomonas or for non-fermenters, they will be negative for the fermenting tube, but they will be positive for the oxidizing tube. So that's the reason why it's that's the reason why it says here they fail to acidify oxidized fermentative media when overlaid with mineral oil. Because if there's mineral oil, the organisms will not be exposed anymore to oxygen. Hence, they are negative on that particular tube. Okay? So I hope that's clear. So let's talk about clinical infections. Um, um, Pseudomonas account for 15% of all gram-negative bacilli isolated from clinical specimen. In fact, we consider pseudomonas as the third leading cause of burn infection. So it is responsible for a number of serious infections, usually following surgery or trauma, such as septicemia, meningitis, osteomyelitis, and even wound infection. Okay? And these are some of the risk factors for the disease. So if you are... Immunosuppression, such as diabetes mellitus, cancer, steroid transplantation. So this will um, make the patient susceptible to pseudomonas. So I'd like to uh, tell you a story of a story of my one of my friends. So one of my friends received uh, my friend received kidney transplant from her sister. So nagkaroon siya ng kidney transplant. Since hindi naman niya twins yon, so that particular kidney transplant um, is not 100% um, identical. So the doctor gave her an immunosuppressive drugs. So the purpose of giving immunosuppressive drugs is that um, this will actually prevent her immune system from attacking the newly transplanted kidneys. So that's the reason why we are giving immunosuppressive drugs. However, the caveat here is that it will make your immune system weak. So the possibility of getting opportunistic infection becomes very high. So the kidney transplantation was successful. However, he di she died. She died because of pneumonia caused by pseudomonas. And... The problem with pseudomonas is the problem with pseudomonas is it is actually resistant to many antibiotics. So that will be difficult for the clinicians to avert the infection. Um, one thing, my mom, um, before before she died, um, she was diabetic. So nagkaroon ng infection yung kanyang foot, nagkaroon siya ng diabetic foot, and she was actually amputated. So Yun yung ano, yun yung mga yun yung mga things that will actually result to um, risk factors for the disease. Trauma such as gunshot, um, knife wound, puncture, surgery burns, or even foreign body implantations such as catheters, urinary or bloodstream, prosthetic devices, corneal implants, or even using of contact lens. And then infused fluids such as dialysate and saline irrigations. So all of these are considered to be as the risk factors for the spread of non-fermentative gram-negative bacilli. Okay. So another characteristic or clues that will indicate that you are able to isolate non-fermenters in the clinical lab is the oxidase positive, maybe weak or variable, and then non-reactivity in 24 hours multi-test kit system. And no acid production in the slant or bat, which I've already explained to you, and resistant to a variety of classes of antibiotics. So the one that you can see here is the fermentation tube. So if it remains red, it means that there's no fermentation. If it's if it's yellow, means means such as this one, it means that there is a fermentation. So so for for pseudomonas or an other non-fermenting gram-negative bacilli, you, you wouldn't expect them to have any reaction in these particular tubes. So how do we classify them? So later on, we will be classifying them 
and and for this particular lecture, we would first classify them whether they are the fluorescent or the non-fluorescent group. So one system uses reaction of three common tests, such as in McConkey, oxidase, and the glucose OF test, the one that I've explained to you a while ago, and results in eight possible combination of the results. So these are the main groupings or the algorithm. So first criteria is that um, PSI should be K over K, meaning to say red over red. And in McConkey, we divided whether they can grow in McConkey or they cannot grow in McConkey. So once they have grown in McConkey, we classify them whether they are oxidase positive or oxidase negative. If they're oxidase positive, we further classify them whether they are oxidizers or non-oxidizers. And same thing with negative for oxidase, oxidizers or non-oxidizers. And then and then for oxidase positive or for not for those who are not able to grow in McConkey agar, we still further subcategorize them whether they are oxidase positive or non-oxidase positive and whether they are oxidizers and non-oxidizers. And with this, we're able to identify um, some of the important organisms, such as um, Acinetobacter baumani is here, Pseudomonas luteola is here. Okay. So anyway, um, these are the grouping of non-fermenters based on eight possible results. However, for today, we will be focusing our discussion into four major groups. So we have the Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, Burkholderia, and Stenotrophomonas maltophila. So formerly known as Santomonas maltophila. Okay, so we will be focusing our discussion in these four major groups. And there has been taxonomic changes, meaning to say, um, there are now there are now new names based from the old names. So, for example, um, nothing much has changed in the first one here. Acromobacter, Siloxovidans, variety Siloxovidans. Um, they have already dropped the variety portion. And then Acromobacter Silosocidans, they have dropped the variety and make it denitrificans only. Wixella is now Bergiella. Pseudomonas diminuta is now Brebundimonas diminuta. And then um, Pseudomonas Malay is now known as Burkholderia Malay. Flavob Flavobacterium glum is now under Criseobacterium. Flavobacterium indulgenes is now Chrysobacterium. Ralstonia is now Cupria vidus. So, nag-iba na yung genus niya. Comomonas acidovorans is now Delftia acidovorans. And then, Chrysobacterium Meningosepticum is now Elizabeth Kingia, Meningosepticum. And then Flavobacterium brevis is now MP, the, in the MP lighter, like Empidobacter brevis. And then Pseudomonas mesophilica is now Methylobacterium mesophilicum. Flavobacterium odorat, odoratum is now Myroides odoratus. And then the CDC group EF is now Neisseria. So, meron siyang Neisseria animaloris and Neisseria zoodegmatis. Acromobacter vivar, so they have now a new name. Ocrobactrub antrophy. And then formerly the CDC W2 and group EO2 is now under Pandorea and Paracoccus respectively. And then Chrysomonas luteola is now Pseudomonas luteola. Moraxella phenylpyruvica is now Cycrobacter phenylpyruvicus. Rosortia piketi is now Rostonia. 
Then Pseudomonas piketti is now Ralstonia piketti. So, ang daming pagbabago, no, guys. Agrobacterium is now Rhizobium. And then Flavobacterium, yung mga gen genera, a genus na Flavobacterium, they have changed it to Sphingobacterium. The same thing with Pseudomonas palsy mobilis and CDC group 1, LLK-1. So, they are now known as Sphingomonas Pausi mobilis. Yun. So as you can see, these are some of the taxonomic changes for some gram-negative non-fermenters. And do you know that um, these particular non-fermenters can produce pigment as well? Yeah, and so they can produce yellow pigment such as the Criseobacterium, Sphingomonas possimobilis, Pseudomonas lutella, Pseudomonas oriza habitans, Sphingobacterium, and Pseudomonas tutseri. Yung tutseri, noteworthy to mention, na hindi lang siya light yellow, wrinkled also at the same time. And then, they can also produce pink. Yung, pip, yung ito yung favorite na ano, bacteria, PPFM ang tawag dito. Pink pigmented, uh, I'm sorry, pink pigmented uh, melitotrophic bacterium. Ayun pala yung ibig sabihin ng pink pigmented uh, melito, me, methylotrophic bacterium. Kasi nga, methylobacterium is an example. And then, prosiomonas. Yeah, so they produce pink pigment. Asinetobacter produces um, purple peg, pigment, pigment, <laughs> pigment, and the one that is responsible for this one is the biolacin pigment. Pero alam nyo ba that biolacin pigment is best, uh, ayan. Ay, hindi pala, sorry. Ang chromobacterium pala yung biolacin pigments. Um, I, I stand corrected. Chromobacterium yung biolacin pigment and, and it is best seen in Luria Bertani medium. And then yung Purple ng Acinetobacter is seen in Maconchi agar. And then, lavender to lavender green in blood agar is Strenotophomonas maltophilia. Tan color, tan color is um, Pseudomonas tutseri and Chuanella putrefaciens. Then, they, some could also produce wrinkled colonies such as Pseudomonas tutseri, um, Pseudomonas oris, sorry, orizi habitans, yeah, medyo nabulol ako doon, and Bulcordiria pseudomalae. And then, some of them can produce sweet color, a uh, sweet odor, such as alkaligenous fecalis. Pagbukas mo pa lang ng incubator, and then you're dealing with this organism, maamoy mo na yung myroides odoratus, and grape-like fruity odor for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and the one that is responsible for this one is amino acetophenone. This is an aromatic compound known as amino acetophenone, responsible for the fruity grape-like odor of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And then um, popcorn, wow, um, uh, amoy popcorn daw, CEO4, and Neisseria zudegmatis and there are also some non-motile um, acinetobacter moraxella cleisobacterium pero yung sphingobacterium may glide and oligella and oxidase negative sila naman yung acinetobacter stratophomonas pseudomonas lutelia pseudomonas hepatia and hydrogen sulfide positive is schwannella putrefaciens okay so these are the characteristics common to group of non-fermenters. So, um, you just study this one in your book. Kasi medyo maliit. Okay. So, biochemical and morphology characteristic of selected non-fermenters. Um, usually, uh, reference lab using nucleic acid sequencing or mass spectro spectro photometric method. So, medyo um, mas mahal ang definitive 
identification because pag sinabi natin nucleic acid sequencing, it's already molecular base. Okay? Another one that would require special machine is the Malditoff. Um, Malditoff would identify bacteria and fungi from colonies that is based on analysis of unique spectra of their peptides, meaning protein based siya, when separated in mass spectrophotometer. Kaya siya tinawag ng time of flight kasi yung kanyang pag-migrate is actually affected by the number of peptides. So for this particular group of organism, the mean time for identification is 6 minutes. Okay, so we will now be discussing first the clinically significant non-fermentive gram-negative bacilli. So under this, we have the pseudomonas. Okay, so pseudomonas accounts for the largest percentage of all non-fermenters isolated from clinical specimens. So we have they have a nickname, and yung nickname nila is actually called pseudomonads. So most members are gram-negative bacilli or coco bacilli, and they met metabolize strictly in aerobic condition. So they are motile with polar flagellum or polar, polar tuff of flagella. So pwede silang lofotrichus. They're oxidase and catalase positive and usually oxidizers of carbohydrates. But definitely, they are non-fermenters. So this is the maconkey agar. They can usually grow on maconkey agar. But the colonies on maconkey agar is either white or colorless because they are non-lactose fermenters. So this group of bacteria are considered to be as non-lactose fermenters. So there are several groups of pseudomonas, and the first group that we will be discussing here are the fluorescent group of pseudomonas. Okay, and one example of fluorescent group of pseudomonas is pseudomonas aeruginosa, and they are found in moist environments. Okay, particularly in pools, hot tubs, catheters, or even humidifiers in hospitals. So they really love water, and they are the causative agent of the so-called hot tub syndrome. So. Reservoir includes plant, soil, or even tap water, and a common part of normal bacterial microbiota. So we're not supposed to have pseudomonas inside our body. So pseudomonas aeruginosa may cause mild illness in healthy people. But if you have comorbidity, which makes your immune system weak, then the infection would become more severe. So so the monas aeruginosa accounts for about 5 to 15% of all nosocomial infection. Especially, they can cause pneumonia or bacteremia. And they are the leading cause of nosocomial respiratory tract infection. Usually, kapag merong cystic fibrosis, yung patient... So most likely makaka-isolate tayo ng Pseudomonas. Yan. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa, this is supposed to be small letter A, I'm sorry for that. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is the agent of blue pus. Yan, kasi um, they can produce different pigments. And one of the pigments that they can produce is the pyocyanin pigment. So the pyocyanin pigment is the reason why Pseudomonas aeruginosa can cause blue pus, particularly wound infections and in burn patients. So they are also common in patients with cystic fibrosis. So they can cause nosocomial UTI and bacteremia. Um, they can also cause um, endocarditis, ear infection, and even skin rashes. Okay, so yung skin rashes that can be caused by pseudomonas 
is because is known as the hot tub syndrome primarily because they really love water. So kapag nagbabad ka pala sa contaminated water, it is possible that you can get skin infection such as this one. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa has a poor prognosis and they also have the so-called colonization factor. Poor prognosis factors include if the patient is in septic shock. Ibig sabihin, um, the bacteria in the blood has caused the drop of blood pressure. So that's what we meant by septic shock. Um, granulocytopenia, meaning to say the number of granulocytes in our, in our blood drop significantly. And it's actually a, a concern because these WBC are important um, to boost up our immune system. Inappropriate antimicrobial therapy, wrong use of antibiotics, that's what we meant by that. And presence of septic metastatic lesion. Metastatic means that it would usually spread easily. Okay? So patients are mechanically ventilated quick uh, may quickly become colonized yan kaya nga pseudomonas is also a concern among patients with covid-19 there are patients who recovered from covid-19 but they still die not because of covid-19 kasi nag negative na sila sa covid-19 but they die due to secondary bacterial infection okay so virulence factors of pseudomonas Pseudomonas includes um, endotoxin, motility, pili, capsule, flagella, and phospholipases. So they have, uh, they can infect the type three. Uh, I mean, sorry, the virulence factor would include also the type three secretion system, which makes um which makes the Pseudomonas aeruginosa uh, highly virulent, particularly during respiratory infection. Um, they can also se produce severe several exotoxins such as proteases, um, hemolysin, el lecithinase, elastase, and DNAs. Okay, so these are the virulence factor of Pseudomonas. So, um, Lipopolysaccharide has antiphagocytic activity or cytotoxic activity. So, and then, um, which means that they can prevent our neutrophil from phagocytizing the bacteria. The pili is important for adhesion. Flagella is important for motility and adhesion. The type 3 secretion system, the one that I told you a while ago, is cytotoxic. Uh, would be important for cytotoxic activity, which will make it difficult for us to overcome pseudomonas. Phospholipases, proteases, exotoxin, all of these are important for, for cytotoxic activity. And capsule would also have the antiphagocytic activity. Okay, so these are the function of some of the noteworthy virulence factors of pseudomonas. So if you will be looking at Pseudomonas in blood agar plate, um, they are actually um, beta hemolytic, which means that they can completely, um, they can put completely uh, hemolyze blood. Okay, and they have the they they have the ability to produce green pigment as well, and the one that is responsible for the green pigment is called pyoverdine, and the one that is responsible for the blue pigment is called pyocyanin. So many strains will produce a fruity grape-like odor. So sabi, tulad nga lang sinabi ko, pagbukas nyo pa lang ng antibiotics, pagbukas nyo pa lang ng, sorry, ng, hindi pala antibiotics, pagbukas nyo ng incubator, you would smell agad the fruity grape-like odor. And it is due to the aromatic compound known as amino acetophenone. Okay, and they can produce green sheen, medyo may greenish sheen dito on blood agar plate. So they are gram-negative bacilli, oxidase and catalase positive. They can oxidize carbohydrates and they are beta-hemolytic. So kita nyo naman dito na 
colorless na yung ano, colonies. Ibig sabihin, complete hemolysis. And they are positive in arginine dihydrolase test, ADH test. So, they can easily grow at 42 degrees centigrade. And they are citrate positive. So, this is the Simon citrate utilization agar. So, Prussian blue is the positive result for that. And this is the cetrimide agar. Um, it is the selective and differential medium for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And you would notice that Pseudomonas aeruginosa here has produced a green pigment because of the pyoverdin pigment. So the pyoverdin pigment is actually responsible for the green pigment of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Okay, so this is the gram stain of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So you'd notice that they are gram negative bacilli. And here's the appearance of Pseudomonas in blood agar plate. Okay, so you'd see that um, beta hemolytic in Maconki agar, they produce white or colorless colonies. And this is the cetrimide agar. In cetrimide agar, uh, they produce. Uh, this, still, this one is still ano, Maconki. Maconki agar pa rin to. In Maconki agar, white or colorless colonies. And do you know that you, re you really do not want to get infected with Pseudomonas aeruginosa? Because Pseudomonas aeruginosa is naturally resistant to many antimicrobial agents. So they are naturally resistant to penicillin, ampicillin, the first and secondary generation of cephalosporins, trimethoframe sulfmetoxazole, chloramphenicol, tetracycline. So typically, we have to use these antibiotics such as the aminoglycosides, the semi-synthetic penicillin, such as the piperacillin and tyrarsilin, and the third and fourth generation of cephalosporin, such as trimet, uh, such as um, cefriaxone, and others. So these are the ideal antibiotics for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Okay, so let us discuss another group of Pseudomonas. So, still under the fluorescent group, we have the Pseudomonas fluorescens and Pseudomonas putida. So, they have, un unlike Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Pseudomonas fluorescens have low virulence, though they are also isolated from respiratory specimen, contaminated blood products, urine, cosmetics, hospital equipment, and fluids. Cosmetics, no? Even cosmetics um, can be the source of infection for Pseudomonas. So, infections include UTI, post-surgical abscesses, empyema, septic arthritis, and wound infection. So, the one that you can see here is an example of lungs with empyema. So, you can actually see that in the x-ray, it's actually blurry because of the empyema. Um, Pseudomonas fluorescence and putida has also the following characteristic. So, Pseudomonas fluorescence and putida can produce pyoverdine, but none of them can produce pyocyanin. Unlike Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Pseudomonas aeruginosa can produce both pyocyanin and pyoverdine. But for for fluorescence and putida, they can only produce pyoverdine. So they cannot grow at 42 degrees, which is unlike Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, they cannot reduce nitrate uh, to, nit to nitrogen gas. They can produce acid from silos, and then they can hydrolyze gelatin. So usually putida is negative, while fluorescence is positive. So for the treatment, um, they are susceptible, just like your Pseudomonas aeruginosa, they are susceptible to um, aminoglycosides, polymyxin, and piperacillin, but they are resistant to carbonicillin and trimetrophim sulfmetoxazole complex. Okay, so let me show you an example of pyoverdine pigment. So again, 
if the organisms can produce pyoverdine pigment, you would notice that the pigment appears um, greenish, while this is the pyocyanin, the blue pigment, and pyorubrin is another pigment which Pseudomonas aeruginosa can produce, and this one is red. So they will produce red pigment. Okay, so these are the different um, type of pigments from Pseudomonas. Okay, so we will now be discussing the non-fluorescent group of Pseudomonas. So you wouldn't expect them to have pigments unlike the fluorescent group. So the one, the first one that we'll discuss here is Pseudomonas tutseri. So they are rare, easily recognizable colony. And you would notice that the colonies are wrinkled. They are leathery, adherent colonies that may produce light yellow or brown pigment. Yes, may pigment pa rin, but the pigment is not fluorescent anymore. Unlike this one, uh, highly fluorescent yung pigment. Okay, so in the immunocompromised host, they are responsible for septicemia, meningitis, HIV infection, pneumonia, endocarditis, post-surgical wound infection, septic arthritis, conjunctivitis, and UTI. So that is the characteristic of Pseudomonas istuzeri. So here's another example of brownish um, wrinkled colonies of Pseudomonas istuzeri. And they are also positive in starch hydrolysis test. Okay, so though they are ADH negative. So Pseudomonas tutseri is susceptible to aminoglycosides, um, sulfmetoxazole, um, ampicillin, polymyxin, tetracycline, fluoroquinolones, and third generation cephalosporins. But they are resistant to chloramphenicol and first and second generation of cephalosporins. Okay, so that is the characteristic of Pseudomonas istutseri. Okay, and then another one here is Pseudomonas mendocina. So they are found in soil and water, and they are rarely isolated from human specimens. So usually, whenever we isolate Pseudomonas mendocina from the human specimen, um, it always connotes that the infection is said to be, uh, that, that is not an infection, but it is it always connotes contaminations. Okay, so, however, there are rare cases of documented endocarditis. So, if you will be looking at identification characteristics, so you would notice that the colonies are non-wrinkled, but they are rather flat, they may produce yellow or brown pigment such as the one that you can see here so they are pyoverdine and actimide negative and they can only oxidize glucose and silene okay so that is the characteristic of pseudomonas mendocina okay and then another one here is pseudomonas pseudoalkaligenes and pseudomonas alkaligenes another contaminants but they are oxidase positive and biochemical biochemically negative in many tests except for of course for the adh so there can weakly ferment fructose and it's quite difficult to identify them primarily because they are negative in many biochemical tests so you need to do malditoff or dna sequencing which is not usually being done in or on a routine basis and then Pseudomonas luteola and or orizi habitants, okay, are isolated also from soil and water. They are rarely isolated from humans, but they can actually cause wound abscesses, blood. They are isolated from wound abscesses, blood culture, and others. So they are implicated in peritonitis. That is the infection of the peritoneal cavity. So yung mga bilbil natin, pwede palang ma-infect yan ng Pseudomonas luteola and Orizi habitants. Okay, so they can grow on Maconchi agar. 
So they produce this particular yellow pigment, wrinkled or rough colonies, after 48 hours. Okay, so they are gram negative and non fermentative. They are oxidase negative, catalase positive, motile, and they can oxidize glucose. So ONPG tests will usually differentiate. Pseudomonas luteola from Orizi habitans because Pseudomonas luteola is positive. So treatment, um, both organisms are sensitive to amino glycosides, the third generation cephalosporins, uridopenicillins, and quinolones. Okay, so that is for Pseudomonas luteola and Orizi habitans. Okay, so let us now discuss the second group of of clinically significant, most commonly isolated gram-negative bacilli, non-fermentative gram-negative bacilli. So this time, we are discussing Acinetobacter. So Acinetobacter um, is the newest member of the family Moraxillaceae. Okay, so it's the, uh, the newest member. Okay, there are only two species commonly isolated in clinical specimen, Acinetobacter baumani. Uh, they are glucose oxidizing non-hemolytic strain. And Acinetobacter wofi. Okay, so they are glucose negative non-hemolytic strain. Okay, so these are the difference, no? Baumani is glucose oxidizing, while Rofi with, um, is actually glucose negative. So this particular acinobacter are usually ubiquitous, ubiquitous, which means that they are commonly found in environment, particularly in soil, water, and food. Um, the reason why they are actually clinically significant is because of the fact that they are mostly associated with hospital equipment. Meaning to say, if patients have been constantly using ventilators, especially nowadays because of the COVID-19 pandemic, humidifiers and catheters, they are also at risk of getting um, Acinetobacter. Okay? So, Acinetobacter, therefore, can be considered as opportunistic. Meaning to say, um, they take advantage of hosts with weak immune system. So it accounts for about 1% to 3% of all nosocomial infections. Um, second most common isolate of these organisms. Okay, And sometimes they are in normal flora. Meaning to say, 25% are found in adults. But it actually increases after tracheostomy. Okay? So after tracheostomy, sa mga nahihirapan, di ba, um, na huminga because of the COVID-19, so they usually perform this procedure. And because of that, um, the population of, of acetinobacter uh, would usually increase by this percentage. So the clinical manifestations would include UTI, pneumonia, endocarditis, septicemia, meningitis, wound, burns, eye infections, and others. So... These are for the Acinetobacter. So Acinetobacter can grow on Maconkey. Okay? Um, they produce a purplish hue, the one that you can see here, para medyo purple yung color. And the thing is, it might be mistaken for lactose fermenters. Kasi ang color ng lactose fermenters is also pur uh, pink. Na medyo hawig sa purple. But iba kasi yung pink sa purple. But if you're not a keen eye, so pagkita ninyo na purple, you would immediately jump into conclusion, ah, na, lactose fermenters to. But then again, remember that Acinetobacter is non-fermenters. So they really cannot ferment any sugar at all. Okay? Pero ang Maconkey kasi, tinuturuan tayo na yung Maconkey, dalawa lang yan. Either na lactose fermenters or non-lactose fermenters. Lactose fermenters ay pink. Non-lactose fermenters ay white or colorless. Pero meron pa palang isang klase ng non-lactose fermenters. Ito yung Acinetobacter. Because Acinetobacter produces purplish 
color. Okay, so I, I hope that's clear for you, okay, in cases of acinetobacter. So for gram stain, so they are cocoid and they are pleomorphic. So pag sinabi natin pleomorphic, it means that they assume a variety of shape. So is there a treatment for acinetobacter? Actually, yes, there is. So isolates are most of the time resistant to many antimicrobials. So vari variable susceptibility to aminoglycoside and beta-lactams plus beta-lactam inhibitor combination should be utilized. So dinis natin to in micro in, in in prelims. So this includes the combination of piperazilin and tazovactam complex. But the problem with acinetobacter is that most of the time they are resistant to the carbapenems group of antibiotics. So are you familiar with carbapenem? So sila yung mga meropenem, imipenem. So um, resistant yung acinetobacter doon. So that's the reason why we usually call them CRAB, which stands for carbapenem resistant acinetobacter baumani. So yung mga CRAB isolates are usually only susceptible to cholestine and TG cycline. TG cycline. Ah, tama. TG cycline. That's the proper pronunciation. Sorry. And then, gen, uh, Acinetobacter wolfi is generally susceptible to most all antimicrobials. So between the two, mas, mas lesser evil see si Acinetobacter wolfi as compared to Baumani. Okay, so another group of organisms that we will be discussing for this morning is Stenotrophomonas maltophila. So I'm sorry again, this is supposed to be small letter M. Um, formerly known as Santomonas maltophila. It is the third most common non-fermentative gram-negative bacillus isolated from clinical laboratory. So una, Pseudomonas aeruginosa followed by Acinetobacter baumani, and now we have Streptomonas maltophila. So just like its predecessor, they are also ubiquitous in the environment, particularly in water, sewage, and plant materials. They are very common in hospital environment, particularly in blood drawing equipment, so where phlebotomy is taking place. So ironically, this can also be found in disinfectants. Parang ang ironic, no? And then transducers and other equipment. Wow. So, mapapawaw ka talaga when you can actually find this bacteria in disinfectants. So, siguro yung mga poor disinfectants. Ay, actually, ano eh, common siya sa Pseudomonas. Do you know that Pseudomonas aeruginosa can even grow on soap? So, ganun katinde yung Pseudomonas. Okay. So anyway, um, clinical infections of, stenotroph of stenotrophomonas maltophila, so they are initially regarded as a saprophyte or colonizer. So what do we mean by the term saprophyte? So pag, when we say saprophyte, it means that these organisms can live in decaying, they can live in decaying organic matter. So that's what we meant by saprophytes. So they are not part of human microbiota. So respiratory involvement common in hospitalized patients. So they can cause pneumonia, endocarditis as a result of surgery and IV drug users, wound infections, and they can even cause bacteremia. So they can rarely cause meningitis and UTIs. So Colonies may appear bluish on McConkey, although yung McConkey natin dito hindi masyadong bluish. They are oxidase negative, non-fermentative gram-negative bacillus. So they are also positive for catalyst test, DNAs, escoline, gelatin, hydrolysis, and lysine. An E-test agar dilution can be performed. So ano ba yung E-test? Kung naalala ninyo yung um, prelim exams, yung prelim discussion natin, yung E-test is like a strip of antibiotics and 
advantage of e-test is that we can actually easily determine the MIC right away. So when we say MIC, a minimum inhibitory concentration. So usually the this organism is susceptible to sulfmethoxazole drug. So it is considered to be as a drug of choice for these organisms. Then another group that we will be discussing for this morning is Burkholderia. Okay, so Burkholderia sepasha complex. So there are at least 18 distinct genomic species of Burkholderia. So all members have been isolated from humans. So Burkholderia um, is a nosocomial pathogen, meaning to say um, they are isolated from the hospital and they can cause pneumonia, particularly in cases of cystic fibrosis. And in this case, the one that you can see here is a chronic granulomatous disease. Kita nyo naman, ang dami niyang metastatic lesion, no? chronic granulomatous disease. So aside from this, they can also cause um, endocarditis, UTI, osteomyelitis, dermatitis, and wound infection. So hospital environment um, is also common ground for the isolation of this bacteria. Um, they can be isolated from fluid, anesthetics, nebulizer, and take note, huh, detergents and disinfectants. So kahit pala sa detergents and disinfectants, pwede pa rin ma-isolate ang Burkholderia. So ganong kat katinde yung organisms na to. So Burkholderia sepasha can grow on most media. So may, may lose viability in ship's blood agar in 3 to 4 days without transfer. So kung gusto mo pala mabuhay ang Burkholderia, you need to transfer from one blood agar plate to another blood agar plate in three to four days. Selective media may also be available uh, to reduce growth of other gram-negative bacteria. So you can use the OFBL medium, which stands for oxidative fermentative base polymyxin B bacitracine lactose agar. Yung pala yung ibig sabihin ng OFBL medium. And BCSA, or the... Burkholderia sepasha selective agar. Okay, so so that we do not want unwanted gram-negative bacilli to grow. So, Burkholderia uh, would produce um, non-wrinkled colonies. Okay, so may be helpful to distinguish it from Pseudomonas tutseri. Kasi yung Pseudomonas tutseri would also produce yellow colonies, yellow pigment. But yung Pseudomonas or yung Burkholderia sepasha would also produce yellow pigment. So the only difference perhaps would be very smooth yung colonies ng Burkholderia sepasha as compared to um, uh, Pseudomonas tutseri. So they can produce a non-fluorescent yellow or green pigment. So Burkholderia sepasha produces weak, slow, positive oxidation reaction. So most strains are can oxidize glucose. Most strains can oxidize maltose, lactose, and mannitol. They are lysine decarboxylase and OMTG positive. Um, they are ornithine decarboxylase and nitrate to nitrite negative, meaning to say they cannot reduce nitrate to nitrite, and they are motile. So is there a treatment? Fortunately, there is. Um, they are naturally resistant to aminoglycosides and polymyxin. So you cannot use these antibiotics for Burkholderia sepasha. Most strains are also resistant to several beta-lactam antibiotics. So therefore, if the, if the isolated organisms are identified as Burkholderia sepasha, then we may use the following antibiotics such as chloramphenicol, ceftazidine, piperazilin, minocycline, and some fluoroquinolones and sulfmethoxazole. So uh, they have varied susceptibility to carbapenems, and they are resistant, and resistance can develop while a patient is being treated. No, kailangan talaga, talagang, if you are this patient, kailangan you are following 
the drug regimen. Otherwise, resistance can easily develop. Okay, so another one that we have here is so Burkholderia malay. Um, it is rare in human, but common respiratory zoonosis known as Farsi in horses. So considered by government agencies to be a potential bioterrorism agent. So they can cause glanders disease. So very rare, only one case in the past 50 years in humans. That was in 2000 due to a laboratory accident. Nagkaroon siya ng glanders disease. Though it is endemic in parts of Africa, Asia, Middle East, Central, and South Americas. Okay. Burkholderia malay is non-motile gram-negative bacillus and can produce non-pigmented colonies in two days. So they can grow on maconkey. They are oxidase. Oxidase production is variable. So pag sinabing variable, some of them could be positive or negative. Glucose is oxidized and nitrates are reduced to nitrites. So it's also ADH positive. Um, because of virulence, susceptibility tests should only be performed in approved laboratories. So hindi kaya nga nagkaroon ng accident in 2000, di ba? Yung isang microbiologist nagkaroon siya ng Burkholderia malay. So CLSI recommends that broth microdilution with Brucella broth and incubation at 35 degrees in ambient air for 16 to 24 hours as the methods to use. So recommended drugs to consider are ceftacidime, imipenem, doxycycline, and tetracycline. So these are the recommended drugs to be used for Burkholderia malay treatment. And then we also have the Burkholderia pseudomalay found in water and muddy soils in South Asia, including Vietnam and Thailand. Do you know that during the Vietnam War, it was known as the Vietnamese time bomb? Okay, so they are also found in Northern Australia and in Mexico. So individuals who travel to endemic areas are at risk of becoming infected with Burkholderia pseudomalay. So by the way, it was formerly known as Pseudomonas pseudomalay, but now it is known as Burkholderia pseudomalay. So considered as a potential agent of bioterrorism. So isolates recovered individuals who has never traveled to an endemic or sh should be reported to local or state public health department. So nakakatakot nga naman na hindi nag-travel sa endemic area yet nagkaroon ng Bukhordia Sudomali. So Bukhordia Sudomali may cause meliodosis. Meliodosis is an aggressive pulmonary disease. So overwhelming septicemia can occur kapag hindi naagapan. So, local infection is possible and pneumonia is the most common presentation. So, you can inhale the organism or you can have cutaneous inoculation. So, once you inhale the organism, pwede magkaroon ng pneumonia and then magkakaroon ngayon ng septicemia. So, from septicemia, kakalat ngayon, pwede magkaroon ng parotitis, bone and joint infection, liver and spleen abscess genitourinary. Kapag cutaneous inoculation naman, ito yung mga skin infection ng Burkholderia pseudomalay. So, Burkholderia pseudomalay is a non-fermentative and, and it will cause also wrinkled colony. So, it would exhibit an earthy odor. So, sniffing of plates should be discouraged. Ha? Hindi, actually, hindi naman dapat talaga inaamoy ang mga culture. Okay? So ash down medium is actually the selective medium for Burkholderia. It's supplemented with colistin, which will produce deep pink colonies. So this is the gram stain appearance of Pseudomonas pseudomalay. So you would notice that there is a bipolar staining. One, two. So parang ganito yung itsura ng staining niya. No? So we call it the bipolar staining in gram stain. So for identification characteristics, they are they are considered as manual non-fermenter system. So Malditov is also useful, and we can also use multiplex PCR. 
but usually not for routine purposes, but usually for research purposes. So is there a treatment for Pseudomonas pseudomalae? Yes. So isolates uh, may be susceptible in vitro to many antimicrobial agents. So the clinical response to therapy is usually slow and relapses are common. So sulfamethoxazole and fluoroquinolone seems to work well clinically. As with many other non-fermenters, the CLSI does not recommend this diffusion. So kailangan gumamit ka ng broad dilution for the antimicrobial susceptibility testing of pseudomalae, pseudomonas pseudomalae. And then we also another one. We also have we also have another one here, um, Burkholderia gladioli. Although buldo uh, Burkholderia gladioli is actually a plant pathogen, but the problem dito is that it may resemble um, um, Burkholderia cepasia. Because the Burkholderia cepasia, this is the medio delicado. Because the Burkholderia cepasia is found in patients with cystic fibrosis and chronic granulomatous disease. But yung humans, hindi tayo may infect ng Burkholderia gladioli because it is a plant pathogen. So ito yung tsura niya under the microscope. But treatment, uh, pwede rin pala tayo ma-infect, no? Siguro if you are immunocompromised. Kaya nga, isolates will be typically susceptible to aminoglycosides, carbapenems, carbapenems, ciprofloxacin, and sulfmatoxazole, and they are resistant to astreonam and cephalosporins, and 100% resistance to polymyxin B is found. Okay, so next meeting, we will be discussing Moraxella, Oligella, and Cycrobacter, and I will end my lecture at this particular slide, and let's have discussion.